something about you seems different. I can't quite figure it out. Cleopatra very much was not African. She was Macedonian Greek. This is not particularly controversial. <laughs> and they cast a black actress to play her. So I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. Because I'm better than you? Fan baiting is a form of marketing used by producers in film studios with the intent of creating fake controversy, garnering publicity, and explaining the negative reviews of a new movie or TV show. And it's all the rage these days. Whenever story creators lack real imagination and the reviews start to show it, talentless hacks do what they've always done. They blame other people. That's right, the anti-racist, the neo-Marxist, and the intersectional left share this in common with Hollywood. They are so committed to an ideology that the truth and talent shouldn't stand in their way. So the moment anyone recognizes their agenda, their tactic is to call those people sexist, racist, homophobic, arachnophobic, claustrophobic, and whatever else they can find. In the golden age of TV, where Breaking Bad was breaking records, these people are so committed to cultural change over and above good storytelling that they don't care if it ruins the story. Fan baiting shows us at least two things. That not only talentless hacks inundate Hollywood, but also that activism has invaded your screens. And people will use whatever tactic necessary to get rid of any resistance. But doesn't Hollywood have the right to put forth their secret gay agenda, just like The Passion and The Chosen have the right to put forth their agenda? The answer to that is obviously yes. But only one side of the aisle shames, cancels, name calls, threatens, and hates whenever you notice their agenda. And that's because the truth is the best remedy to hate. Since there is so little of it in the storytelling of the modern left, they have to find tactics to win. They don't believe in civil discourse, and they don't believe in free speech. They believe in coercion and soft force. We all see what fan baiting really is. It's an overt attempt to shift culture left and to shame anyone who stands in the way because they notice. Whether it's the lame rings of dower trying to shove feminism in our face or Indiana Jones standing against toxic masculinity, there's an agenda. But honestly, should we just give Harrison Ford a break? I mean, you're already totally defenestrated, huh? These pathetic attempts are even seen in the desire to racialize everything like Netflix's Black Cleopatra. What's next? White Black Panther and Black George Washington? Stop it, don't get any ideas, Hollywood. I know you don't have any original ones. Stop it! If there wasn't a cultural battle taking place, then how did we get to the place where our nation celebrates the No Name Calling Week, LGBT Plus History Month, National Freedom to Marry Day, Transgender Day of Visibility, Day of Silence, International Day of Pink, National Honor Our LGBT Elders Day, International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia, Harvey Milk Day, Pride Month, Pulse Night of Remembrance, Christopher Street Day, and oh, don't forget, National Transgender Children's Day. And all of those holidays just bring us up to the month of June. All that to say this, watch the movies that you want to watch and enjoy them if you want. But do not dare mistake the secular view of reality as an objective and neutral stance on morality. Everyone has a moral stance. It's just that Christians actually have the goods to back up where their morality is coming from if they're asked. When the left is asked, they know they stand on such empty, hollow virtue signaling they have to lie. The idea of neutrality is a lie. So it's time to pick a side. The holy middle and the radical center do not exist except on issues of unimportance. I've heard it all before. I don't want to be political. I just want to preach the gospel. Fine, don't be political, just be moral. But when you do, be honest. When you take a stand on protecting children from gender mutilation, protecting children in the womb, viewing people based on the conduct of their character, not the color of their skin, I want you to stop and I want you to look around you'll find that you're firmly on the right side of the political aisle on all of those issues, whether you like picking a political side or not. Once that startling revelation catches up to you, it might be time to quit the denial and admit, okay, fine, I'm a Republican, I'm conservative, and furthermore, much of the modern Democratic Party is immoral and unchristian. In that moment, you'll realize you should pay attention when Trump is indicted by a partisan DOJ for doing the exact same thing Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden did. You may want to take notice when the Nashville Shooters Manifesto was released by the parents of the killer to the parents of those that were killed at the Covenant School. 
and you do well to know why the first taxpayer-funded Catholic school is causing some to quickly run to the separation of church and state while forgetting that the public school system continues to pull a hard left and the taxpayers pay for that. And we'll talk about all that and more today on Indie Thinker. Welcome to the show. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Now, many people are talking about what kind of investments are a great hedge against inflation. Well, anything that keeps the government away from you as far as possible. And perhaps one of those investments at least is owning private property. So if you want to invest in the real estate market or you're just in the market to buy your own home and you're wondering to yourself, am I ever going to be able to afford a home in this economy? I mean, just the other day I saw a meme where it said millennials buying a house and it was like people walking down the aisle of Home Depot Lowe's or something looking at cardboard boxes. And so the reality is, is yes, it's very difficult to find a house. And you may be thinking to yourself, I'm going to overpay for a house and the interest rate is so high. But the reality is this, is that the best hedge against the kind of inflation that we're seeing right now and the best way to protect your family's financial future is to invest in real estate. Sure, interest rates are high. My can tell you that. But that doesn't mean that you won't be able to later refinance. And did you know that our show sponsor today, the Kevin Blair team over at Element Home Loans can help you refinance your home without any cost out of pocket whatsoever. Now to see what they can do for you and more, you need to go to kbmtg.com because not only can they pre-approve you totally for free, but they can give you all the information that you need upfront in a quick and easy way, giving you great customer service so that you can have the freedom to go out and shop for your new home. But again, to do that, you need to go to kbmtg.com. And when you do so, let them know that Indie Thinker sent you. A couple weeks back, I was with my family taking a vacation, and my little boy who never meets a stranger was playing with another little boy who was a stranger to us. And uh, they were building something that looked like a boat, kind of, you know, six year old kids. Nonetheless, um, he said, Hey, we're building Noah's boat. And the little boy beside him said, Who's Noah? And then my son looked at him and said, you know Noah, the guy from the Bible. And then the little boy responded to him and said, what's the Bible? And then my boy incredulously looked back at him and said, you don't know what the Bible is? Which um, just means I'm raising my boys correctly. But that's not the whole moral of the story there. The moral of the story is, is that my son then went and got his little devotional that he brought with him on vacation and then handed it to the little boy as a gift to him because he said that he wanted to give him a Bible because he had because the little boy didn't know what the Bible was. Now, uh, yes, I am raising moral giants in my house, but, but also I, as a parent, am consistently concerned about the kind of culture that my kids are going to inherit when they finally get old enough to pay attention to everything that's happening all around them. I believe it is mine and your responsibility to make sure we pass down a couple of different things to them, but but also one of the major things that I want to make sure to pass down to them is a culture that's better than the way than the way I found it. So in order to do that, we need to pay attention to what's happening all around us. And I think, point in case, what is happening with Donald Trump is an incredibly important thing to pay attention to. So Trump was just indicted. The Justice Department's special counsel has unsealed the indictment against Trump, and he is set to stand trial for 37 charges, including obstruction and unlawful retention of defense information. So all of you guys know that this stems from all of the boxes of supposedly classified documents that Donald Trump did indeed have the power to declassify that were found at his Mar-a-Lago estate. Now, There's more to it than that, but essentially you should know this. At the end of the day, if Trump is found guilty, it would send him to prison for the rest of his life, and um, it could could cause him over 100 years in in penalties if, if he's found guilty on all accounts. So a lot of conversation is happening around this, and there's many different takes. And what I want to try to provide you is just, I think, the bigger overarching question in all of this. Now, a lot of people are just saying, hey, at the end of the day, if Donald Trump just broke the law, shouldn't he pay for that? But in my opinion, this is not purely about the law. Now, you may say, how can you say that? This is about what Donald Trump did by having all of these documents 
in Mar-a-Lago. Well, of course, we know that Joe Biden did something very similar and did so when he was the vice president, not the president. So he didn't have that plenary power to declassify any documents. Of course, we also know that Hillary Clinton was was also alleged to have done the same thing, but we'll never know because she quickly erased all of her servers so that there would be no evidence found. If anything, Trump is the kind of haphazard goof that he is, that he left all of that stuff in boxes, paper copies in boxes all around his house. Now, there is one other kind of other added element to this that gives the question some legitimacy. There seems to be some recordings of Donald Trump stating that he knows that what he has is classified documents and that he was showing it to people at Mar-a-Lago. And if that's true, then when his attorneys were ordered to tell the FBI that they didn't know that they had any classified documents and whatnot, that essentially Trump was getting these people to lie to federal officials. So all of that could lead to some very, very serious charges. Now, I'll be the first to say yes. So those who... Um, the truth and justice Democrats who say if Trump broke the law, even if you're a Republican, wouldn't you want him to stand trial on those laws that he broke? And so hypothetically, I think the answer to that is yes. But also, I you cannot help but feel like this is just a partisan attempt on behalf of Democrats to try to get at Trump. And so the real question for me at the end of the day is not, did he break the law and should he pay for it? It's why does the left continually try to throw mud at the wall until it sticks? Now, a lot of people are accusing the Democrats of something I won't give them the credit for doing, playing 4D chess. You know, they're trying to make sure that the Republican base is really stirred up in their ire so that they make sure that Trump is their man for 2024 because they believe that Trump is infinitely beatable against the rotting corpse that is Joe Biden. Now, I, I think that there may be some merit to that because I don't want to treat them as though they are a bunch of haphazard goons. But but I will tell you this. My biggest objection to that is just simply that the Democratic Party is so evil and so corrupt that they are not putting their principles and their strategy above their wickedness and their hatred. They hate Donald Trump so much that from the moment he got in office to the very present, they have tried to do everything in their power to throw false allegations at Trump. Now, I'm not saying these present allegations are false. I'm just simply saying this, that the motivating principle for those on the left in the Democratic Party is hatred and a blind hatred of sorts that they don't care about whether Trump broke the law or not. So where does that hatred come from? See, this is, I think, the question at the end of the day that we have to be willing to ask ourselves. Sure, dig into the information about what the Justice Department is doing now and dig into the fact that the Justice Department is led by the opposition in the upcoming election. Dig into all of that, but don't lose the uh, the forest for the trees, because I think that we need to understand here something very, very important. Why is Donald Trump such a threat? Why have they gone after him in the way that they have? And I think simply this. I think Donald Trump is an outsider and therefore a threat to the established authority. And that is why Donald Trump is such a huge problem for the Democratic Party. See, it's not that he's racist. It's not that he's a Russian cat's paw. It's none of those things. It's none of the things that you've heard from the mainstream media. It's just simply this, that the political class in America, and maybe we'll include right and left in this, but I certainly know it's on the left side of the aisle, are so wicked and so evil that they would even start a whole war to cover up their corruption, maybe in the Ukraine, which essentially makes them war criminals. And I know we don't like to think this way, but but I'm just going to tell you that it's time for us to break the naive bubble that is all around us and realize that there is a group of people in Washington that are so evil, so wicked, so corrupt, so reprobate that they would hurt other people to make sure that they hold on to their power and they would kill as well. So the way I think about this is, is just this way. How did Trump become the kind of everyman candidate? How did he become the person that within the Republican Party, blue collar workers are attracted to and think this is a guy that can relate to us? Well, only in one way. 
He is every man only in that he is not what those men are like in Washington, D.C. Because Trump is an outsider, he is just a small sliver of light shining that whatever little light that he has, shining that small little bit of light onto those group of vampires in D.C. that they cannot stand him and they hate him. And they will do whatever it takes to get rid of him simply because he is a threat to their established order. Make no mistake, Donald Trump is not a pillar of moral fortitude. He is not some picturesque Christian example of what the uh, modern Christian should be. There's no Christian on the planet that believes that Donald Trump is. We simply believe this, that he is not what they are. And I think they know it. And what they're doing consistently, presently with these uh, with these documents and everything that they've done prior to that is simply an attack on Donald Trump because they do not want to let go of their power and because they are so wicked, they will do whatever it takes to hang on to it. And they are so desperate to hang on to their power that here comes the second reason that they are willing to do this Trump indictment and perhaps not willing to do uh, the Biden and Hillary Clinton indictment. They are so committed to hanging on to their power and will do whatever it takes to do so that they will weaponize the DOJ and destroy the country in the process. You may ask yourself, why does a Christian podcaster care about this overtly political issue? And it isn't simply because I want to defend Donald Trump as a small sliver of light, which, trust me, it is a small, small sliver of light amongst the the narcissism and the self-interest. But it's at least enough light for those vampires on the left, like I said. But the reason I, as a Christian podcaster, want to address this and want to try to help us realize what's really going on is that, frankly, I like America. And the same people who want to destroy America want to destroy the church. And they are willing to do whatever it takes to secure their power so much so that they do not care what stands in their way. So in this way, I believe that the Christian church has a common enemy with those who wish to destroy America. And and here's why I think America matters, because you may think to yourself, now aren't you mixing your patriotism with your spirituality and aren't you a Christian nationalist now? No, I have some simple facts for you that hopefully will help you in you know, the whole thought process thing that we should all go through. And it is this. America sends and receives more missionaries than any other country. In 2010, 400,000 missionaries were sent out. 127,000 of them were from America. Now, Brazil came in as a distant second with 34,000 missionaries being sent out. That's a lot of missionaries from America in comparison to the rest of the world. Christians pour tens of millions of dollars into a single continent to help them with water, basic necessities, food, so that they can live and to help people hear the gospel. Tens of millions of dollars were poured into Africa just in the year 2008 alone. In 2018, one Christian organization sent $20 million just to Uganda. See, whatever threatens America cannot help but be seen very often as an attack on the principles that this country was founded upon and the principles that this country stands for. This country has been one of the greatest boons, not only for Christian missions, but also for humanitarian acts around the world. And by and large, those humanitarian acts have been done by Christian NGOs. So, Forgive me if I can't help but see an anti-Christian nationalist sentiment. You know, there's all this talk about Christian nationalism today. Well, there is an anti-Christian sentiment in the nation, and it is among those people who wish to destroy and wish to lie, to cheat, and even kill to make sure that they secure their power. And I believe that every single Christian has an obligation to stand up for the truth, especially in those areas where the things that we love are threatened the most. Now, I started the show by talking about we're going to be handing down something to our kids. I hope we understand that one of the few things that we get to hand down to them, one of the few things we can choose to hand down to them, is the culture that they will inherit one day. I hope you as a parent care enough about that culture that you're willing to stand up, defend it, and make sure that you make it a better place than the way that you found it. Now, if we're going to do that, we have to pay attention to things like what is happening right next door to me in Nashville, because the Nashville shooter, the trans shooter, Audrey Hale, her parents are going to release the manifesto that has been kept secret by the Nashville police and others. They're, they're going to release that now to the parents of those 
who were murdered at the Covenant School. Yeah. And this from the Daily Mail. A lawyer for the parents of Nashville school shooter Audrey Hill said a manifesto found by investigators after the massacre will be handed to the families of students at the school. The pledge made public during a court hearing on Thursday comes amid an ongoing legal battle over whether the writings by Hale, who killed three children and three adults at the Covenant School on March 27th, should be made public. Lawyers for the victims, families, and the school have argued against the release of the so-called manifesto, but others, including some media outlets and national police associations, say it should publish. Hale, 28, a trans man, in other words, a biological woman, a real woman, and a former student at the school detailed how she spent months planning the atrocity. Now, the main argument here for not releasing this manifesto is found in what you just heard from the Daily Mail, which tends to be on the right in many ways, but also it's from the UK, so come on. Um, but within what you just heard is something that I think you need to sharpen your common sense with and not be so quick to believe. We just heard that the families are the one that are really standing in the way of the manifesto being released because it could re-traumatize some of these families that are still trying to recover from the death of their loved ones, and it could create a blueprint for future killers. Now, calling me skeptical, but I would believe that, sure, there may be some family members that don't want this released, but by and large, the vast majority of people do want it released because it contains information that is vital for us to hear. But if you read that Daily Mail article, you would think it's just these external third-party organizations that want it released, uh, but not necessarily these families. And now, color, again, color me skeptical, but I, but I think that there are plenty of people among the group of these Nashville families that do want this released and for good reason. So let me respond to some of the objections here. There, there are some that say it's a blueprint for future people who want to uh, want to do these kind of shootings in, in the future. So we don't want to kind of continue to stoke this kind of animosity. So why reveal it? Well, I'll tell you this. It's a blueprint, all right. It's a blueprint for how leftist ideology is ruining people's lives. The real reason they don't want this thing released is that very many people predominantly those on the left I'm speaking about here, they don't want you to know that trans people are suffering deeply from mental illness. They're suffering deeply from the ideology that is, even if it's you wouldn't classify it as mental illness, because I think we need to be careful about this, um, it, they, it, it exposes how the mainstream media and the modern day left are exacerbating an ideology that is very damaging to people. Now, let me just preface real quick before I read an article to you. The reason I am cautious about ascribing mental illness to people is that if there is a logical basis by which you are saying that some of these acts of atrocity should take place, then then is it really mental illness? Let me give you the example here. So most people would not say that Hitler was mentally ill. They would say that he is evil. Why? Because they don't want to take agency away from Hitler. They want him to be fully responsible for what he did to Jews. They don't want to give him any out whatsoever. Now, aren't we doing that to a group of people who, yes, are struggling with some mentally debilitating lies, but a group of people who have been told by the mainstream media and other outlets and continue to speak amongst themselves that if anybody doesn't say your gender pronouns or if anybody doesn't respect the fact that you think you're a woman trapped in a man's body, then, then ultimately they're committing genocide against you. Well, see, the logical conclusion there is that if there's some that wants to commit genocide against you and a group of your friends, well, then you would best defend yourself. This is the implicit acknowledgement. And so ultimately, all we've done with the trans movement in America is to exacerbate a false ideology that deeply damages the psyche of people. And that is found in this quote from Ellen Page, who now goes by Elliot Page and believes herself to be a man. Now, of course, if you remember who Ellen Page is, she is the actor from things like the Umbrella Academy and other films like Juno. Now, you may remember her and you may not, but she just recently released a book called Page Boy. In it, she gives some harrowing tales about what has happened to her since since her transition and before that. Now, this is from an article from the LA Times, but she goes into detail in the book about this instance. But this is 
a moment before she decided that she was actually a man. Uh, this is the incident that took place in her life prior to that. And it says this, quote, Alone in the stillness, Paige started to crack. All of the self-hatred he'd, now forgive me, this is obviously LA Times, it's really she, but he'd been pushing down for years. The discomfort he felt in his body, the anger toward those who'd told him to repress his identity, spelled out. One night he tried to knock himself out, took his knuckles to his face and punched over and over until bruises formed. For days after he sat in a lawn chair on the porch, ashamed, his face sore, and then he heard a voice. You don't have to feel this way. It was a small voice, barely discernible, but it kept echoing in his head, a way out. It was as if something in my brain turned around, recalls Paige, now 36, the agonizing voice saying, no, you're not, no, you can't, just switched and became very gentle and loving. Oh, maybe I'm trans. Why don't I explore that? Within weeks, he scheduled a Zoom consultation with a doctor to discuss top surgery. So let's just get this really clear for the record, according to Ellen Page herself. She beat herself senseless in her own face until she was sore and then started hearing voices in her head and she obeyed those voices and that's what caused her to perform her trans surgeries. So forgive me for recognizing the obvious here, but these people are suffering greatly. The release of this manifesto will only detail that even further. And that is a potential reason why the left and those in power don't want this manifesto to be released because it will tell you the truth about transgenderism and how it is impacting people in such a negative and harmful way. Now, the second reason is this, is they don't want you to know that the trans community is suffering mentally in this country and it's being exacerbated by the conversations that liberals and leftists are having about the issue, but they also don't want you to know that as a result of the way this group of people is suffering mentally, they are also deeply violent. Now, a couple, uh, a couple of arguments here. If these people would chop up their own body you know, the thing that you're supposed to love, the thing that you're supposed to care about more so than maybe even other people's body, if they would do this to themselves, why wouldn't they do it to you? Why wouldn't they do it to yours? See, this inability to understand the sanctity of life is deeply troubling for all of us. And this is seen in the trans movement consistently. The Nashville shooter is not the first trans terrorist to go take a gun and try to kill people. Of course, this has happened before. I'm not saying that everybody who's trans is going to take up a gun and is innately violent. I am just saying that the ideology of transgenderism is a violent ideology. Now, to boot, we, as I've expressed before, that we have a media and political class who is exacerbating this issue. Three days after the shooting, Biden announced that it would be Trans Day of Visibility. And then one day after Trans Day of Visibility and only four days after the trans activist that sh shot and killed all those people in Nashville, there was a planned day of vengeance by the trans community. Now, there was a lot of hubbub online. Hubbub, that's a ridiculous word. Nonetheless, there's a lot of commotion online about what that day would actually look like. Was there really going to be vengeance so shortly after what took place in Nashville? And why were these people calling for vengeance in the first place? So according to one of the activists on Twitter that I believe was responsible for coordinating this day, had this to say about Trans Day of Vengeance. Quote, Trans Day of Vengeance has long been a trans community meme meant to exercise frustration with the way the rest of society constantly tramples on us. It's not a call for violence. End quote. Now, so the obvious implication here is that we're, we're just using it kind of euphemistically. Vengeance doesn't actually mean vengeance, even though this is on the heels of a Nashville shooter killing six people that was a trans activist. What we mean when we say when we say vengeance is no, not violence. We just mean airing out our frustrations. And so uh, what was planned was on the steps of the Supreme Court, there would be a group of trans activists that would join um, that would join with other people that day and would have their day of vengeance. What that would look like, we'll never quite know, because not only were the tweets taken down by Twitter because they were an incitement of violence, actually, unlike January 6th, but also because 
this community thought that they needed to protect themselves from everybody else. They can't have a trans day of vengeance even in peace. They can't go around hurting other people in peace because others had issues with this and they started getting a bunch of hate comments on Twitter. So in response to this, the same person who helped coordinate this event replied to someone on Twitter and this is what they had to say. So I want you to hear it in their own words. Quote, we came up with trans day of visibility because it's a double-edged sword. Some of us said, we don't need visibility, we need vengeance. But if you read it as trans people seeking vengeance in a violent way, do you think it might be violence we are responding to? In other words, and I love this, we would never have a trans day of vengeance. But if we did, it would be because people are trying to hurt us. And of course, we're just protecting ourselves. But again, we would never have a real day of trans vengeance and create violence. But again, if we did, we would be justified in doing that, right? So this is the playbook of the left over and over again. This isn't happening. But if it is happening, it's really good that it's happening. And then, yeah, it's kind of happening, but not a whole lot. I mean, it's a little bit happening. And then, yep, it's happening. It's really good that it's happening. And we're going to celebrate it and do it as much as we possibly can. So all I can say in summation to all of this is that I think the manifesto should be released because I think it's time to be honest with people, as honest as we possibly can. Because honesty and truth should be seen, especially in a world of lies, as a supreme act of compassion. And we'll see that in our final story as we dig into Bible study with Democrats. Oh God of pronouns. Well, apparently Catholics, at least in the state of Oklahoma, have way more heart and backbone than the average evangelical Protestant because the archdiocese there fought and won the right to have the very first ever publicly funded Catholic charter school. So this made news and created some controversy from some people who hate God, hate religion, and deeply misunderstand the separation of church and state. So we'll talk about all that. But a quote from a local news outlet about what took place says this, quote, St. Isidore of Seville Catholic Virtual School would be the country's first religious charter school, which by definition is a publicly funded school that is privately run. Notre Dame Law School's Religious Liberty Initiative Clinic advised the Catholic Archdiocese of Oklahoma City and the, Archdi and the Diocese of Tulsa, which spearheaded the application for the school. The process for St. Isidore of Seville started when Archbishop of Oklahoma City Paul Coakley notified the state in November of 2021 that the archdiocese would be applying for authorization to form and operate a virtual charter school. So essentially all this means is that there would be taxpayer dollars that would fund a Catholic school. Now this was already happening in limited fashion, but not completely funded as this charter school would be. Now the DA for the state of Oklahoma quickly spoke out against this and called it a slippery slope. So here's his comment. Well, the current AG telling the board today, the school quote, intends to be a fully Catholic school Catholic in every way, Catholic in teaching, Catholic in employment, and that would, quote, clearly violate the First Amendment and the Oklahoma Constitution for a public school. Drummond goes on to say, the approval of the SISBC application will create a slippery slope and open the door to other religious schools to use taxpayer money. So the idea here is just wait until the Muslims start their own school and the Satanists start their own school. What will you Christians think about this then? Great whataboutism. So uh, why do they think this is a good argument? I've heard this very often about the Second Amendment. Uh, leftists and liberals will say, oh, you just wait until black people start exercising their Second Amendment right. Then will you really be about the Second Amendment, you white Christian nationalists? Hmm? And of course, the answer to that is, yes, we rejoice whenever there is anybody who is practicing their Second Amendment right in a responsible way. We don't care about the color of their skin, much like you seem to always care about the color of people's skin. Mm -hmm. So the reality is it, there's a lot of things going on here. But first and foremost, can I just please define democracy for everybody here? It's the will of the people in the form of policy. So if the Satanists want to start their own school um, and they want it publicly funded, that's fine. Create your own school. But let's make sure that you only get funded in so far as you are able to enroll students. So in other words, when the Christian school has 500 students and you have 
zero students at your, your school, let's make sure that we understand that you get publicly funded only in so far as you are able to enroll students. So the will of the people, sure. If there are Satanists out there that want to start their own school that nobody on the planet would ever go to, have at it, friend. And the same thing with the Muslim and everybody else. The reality is just simply this. There's this idea about the separation of church and state that is vastly overblown and deeply misunderstood on this issue. I'll explain, but first, let me exemplify it for you here. So here are two local newscasters, one of which suggesting that the separation of church and state is a constitutional right. Let's learn. Stephanie Haynes is joining us right now live to explain all of this. And, and I think a lot of people would question whether they're for it or against it. Is this constitutional? Well, Adrian, that is certainly the question that is going to come up in court as certain groups have already indicated they would like to challenge this, saying as you are questioning, does this violate the First Amendment, the separation of church and state? If I had a dime for every time I heard somebody say that the separation of church and state is found in the Constitution, I would be a millionaire by now. Um, but of course, in Joe Biden's economy, I'm going to need a little bit more than that. So keep on racking up your misinformation people. The reality is, is that the separation of church and state is not found in the Constitution anywhere. Separation of church and state is a phrase found in a letter that was written by Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist. And even when he was placing it there, he was saying that the government will not infringe upon your private right to practice your religion. He was not saying that we should institute this secular state where Christian morality has no place in society. That would be totally ridiculous. It's totally foolish. So the First Amendment and the Establishment Clause clause in the First Amendment says this. It says that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of any religion or the free exercise thereof. So let me break this down for you very briefly. That clause just simply means this in the First Amendment. It means that the government cannot establish a state church and then force people to go to it. That's what it means by the establishment of religion. And then secondly, that it cannot prohibit the free exercise thereof. So in other words, the First Amendment gives people the right to practice their religion, not to keep people away from practicing their religion in the public square. Think about it this way. The First Amendment is about free speech. We all know that is the free speech amendment. You know, we say we have the right to free speech, and then we have the Second Amendment is the right to protect that right to free speech. So how does it make sense that the right to free speech is construed as the right to cram down secularism upon people and make sure that their private religion has no place in the public square. Of course, that would be ridiculous. Think about it this way. Our laws in this nation are undeniably influenced by Christian scripture. Now, if they're not, I would love to know where that thou shalt not kill thing comes from because it doesn't come from secular ideology. It is undeniable that Christianity influence, has, it has influenced and still influences some of the way that we think about all of these things. Now, suffice to say, the whole idea that this is in some way unconstitutional for public funds from taxpayers to go to fund a Catholic school is totally ridiculous, and it is not unconstitutional. You can only do that by reading into the original language of the Constitution and putting your own secular viewpoint upon it. And that's what most people won't recognize, is that they have a presupposition that they're bringing to the Constitution and trying to infuse that upon it. Now, it's not our fault that you don't like Christians, you don't like Jesus, and you don't like Christianity as a whole. But the reality is, is that this whole thing about there being this neutral state government that doesn't take a moral side on anything is totally ridiculous. The lie of neutrality is on full display here. And it's on full display in this way. Right now, the funds of taxpayers are going to fund the public school system, or in other words, a non-neutral left-wing indoctrination factory. That's where our public funds are going right now. They are already not neutral. They're funding left-wing indoctrination factories. And if that were even worth the case, let me ask you the question. Where are all the TikToks of the Christian teachers you know, kind of whispering into the camera saying, today I got to share about Jesus with my students. And I even had a student pray the sinner's prayer. Oh, it's so great. 
No, that's not happening. You know why? Because the left-wing indoctrination factories are actually teaching small children and middle schoolers and high schoolers left-wing gender ideology. They're teaching people that men can be women and women can be men and that men can menstruate and that men can get pregnant and that men can play in women's sports. And it's funny how this is all men cramming things down on women, but nonetheless, pay attention, feminists. It's interesting to me that all the TikToks that we see are teachers talking about making sure that they teach children about appropriate pronoun usage. So, of course, we all know the reality is that the public school is not neutral when it comes to morality. They are in every way, um, as much as they possibly can, shifting further and further and further to the left. Now, that is not to say that every single teacher or every single school district in the nation is all a bunch of left-wing indoctrination factories exclusively. But that is to say this, there is a double standard here. And I hope you're honest enough, intellectually honest enough, um, to realize that this is true. So what would be the big problem at the end of the day for just having a school for every segment? Fine. I, I'm for universal school choice. I'm fine with the public funding schools, even if you disagree with it, since we're already doing it now, as long as the students and the parents get to make those decisions for the kids and those funds are appropriated apportionately. More than that, I also want to say this. I'm a free speech absolutist, and that means it is incumbent upon the people who want to oppose free speech to argue for why free speech should not be heard in the first place. So it is incumbent upon those in the Oklahoma uh, City School Districts to tell us why the government should not be funding a Catholic school. And I think ultimately what you'll find is a bunch of Christian hate at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day, when we're talking about left-wing ideology being promoted in public schools— and we're talking about religion not being in public schools, you have to ask yourself why that double standard? Because it's interesting, because left-wing gender ideology is basically a complete fabrication of deconstructionist. And religion actually has been a part of world history since civilizations have existed. Christianity, Judaism, Islam. I believe that comparative religion should be taught in every single public school across America. And you say, well, who's going to teach that? Well, how about not an idiot atheist that wants to turn everybody into an atheist? How about one day you get a, a Christian to come in, the next day you get a Buddhist to come in, the next day you get a Muslim to come in, and let's let free speech have its way. The reason the left is so afraid of free speech is because they understand the power of ideas. If they're not crammed down people's throat, the truth can actually win. And so I believe that free speech demands that we have the opportunity to allow this Catholic school to come out, do its thing, to be publicly funded, and then if it is successful and if it is good, then to be promoted. But unfortunately, that's not even what we do with government schools today. You can fail, you can make sure kids don't read, have math skills or anything else, and then you can still get government funding. But all of that is a side note to the more important point. The reason I'm a free speech absolutist is because I truly believe and think that Christianity is the superior idea. I believe if given the opportunity to have the freedom to operate within the public square and to have its way, that ultimately Christianity will win the day because it is replete with so much important information, so many deep truths and so much spiritual nourishment that it is undeniable. See, the only way the left has won in America is through the suppression of the truth, because whenever the truth is allowed to flourish, it makes people better. So look at the world as we shift further from Christ. It gets more suicidal, more dangerous, and less meaningful. But the more we uphold the spiritual truths of the past, the greater our society becomes. So if you ask me, we need more charter schools like this one in Oklahoma, and I hope we see more and more of it, along with more free speech and the proliferation of the best ideas. So may the best idea win. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and to go with God.